Welcome again to CISO Point of View, another great episode. I'm joined with Sunil Varki. Sunil, thanks for being here with us. Thank you very much, Doran. Sunil, I, I know you have a huge amount of experience both as a CISO and CTO across a number of different industries from banking, financial services, technology and telco. Tell us a bit about your experience in a nutshell. So I spent around 25 years in the IT, so IT um, environment. In that one, around 21 years is on information security. Uh, I started as a sister administrator with a bank in Saudi Arabia. From there, um, I worked in various industries like uh, financial services. I was with HSBC. I was with Barclays. I was the CISO for a telco with around 120 million subscribers. I was with General Electric for a long period of time. Um, I was a Wipro at, uh, or, or a CISO, global CISO for Wipro for around um, six years. I was also a Wipro fellow. Um, uh, and um, prior to that, I was also uh, at the CTO for Symantec, uh, looking after Middle East, Africa and Eastern Europe. So worked um, both at operations and front end and CISOs, all, all different perspectives of security domains I worked on. Amazing. Fantastic. All right. So I'm going to throw some questions at you. Hope you're ready. Yes. Um, let's start with you. Based on your experience, what are the measures that organizations should take to really be prepared for the next ransomware event? Perhaps a measure that they're not undertaking today. See, ransomware attack is a reality and, and the adversaries are extremely motivated on that part. For the reason they are getting a lot of money or their objectives are getting met. Uh, so I have worked on a couple of countries where ransomware is their biggest problem where, because the reason is uh, the country, a lot of organizations are into mining and they pay the money. So because of that, more and more ransomware attacks come to the region. And it is not only specific to that country, it is a global issue ransomware. Initially, if you look at ransomware was more of an availability attack. So they used to lock your data and say that, okay, you pay the ransom, um, we release it. Now that has moved into a situation saying that there, there are one side is the availability, second side is confidentiality, where they are saying we are going to release this data to the public. So they are increasing the, their weaponry on the entire thing, which is dangerous. We could also reach to a situation where they can go much, much disruptive on that factor. Okay. And, and fundamentally, if you look at it, the ransomware, Organizations has to be very well prepared that it is something which is going to happen to somebody else. It's not that somebody it will happen to somebody else. It is a reality. It can happen to us at any point of time. Our backups and availability scenarios are, has to be worked out in all manners. OK, now, even if you uh, just let me drift a little from the ransomware. If you look at any attack which is happening in your network, which is going to impact your availability or a confidentiality or an integrity, which also is, is in the similar nature now, because earlier ransom was only on availability. Now it is increasing to the other space. All attacks are the same way. So at a component level, granular level, organization has to be prepared to face that the situation and come out of it at the earliest possible. So, so, so that's where we are moving and we will see more and more ransom attack happening around us. Uh, going forward. Do you think there's any specific measures that banks should do that perhaps are different to other industries? See, it, it is not. So we have not seen many banks which is totally being attacked uh, where the banks got into trouble. We have not seen much of that. Uh, ransomware is immaterial where which industry you are in. I have, I have worked with telcos which are going through the problem, mining companies, government agencies. So it, it, it is cut across everywhere. See, fundamentally, one of the problems the organizations are facing, we lost our visibility and control of our own environment. So wh while I say that, so we traditionally we worked on on layered security approach where everything was in place we knew what is inside traffic what is outside traffic so we had the perimeters well defined with the covid coming into picture that perimeter is completely vanished earlier also with cloud it was vanishing but now it accelerated to a different way desktops has moved into home system uh, to to end users which is exposed direct to internet and so many attacks has happened so much of personas and the identities are already being leaked. 
we don't know how, what is the posture of each of these devices which is uh, with each of these users accessing critical resources the visibility of the posture of my devices the inventory of my applications devices users traffic we don't have it accurately traditionally if you look at the it world was trying to build a cmdb and then they said it's too difficult let us do a cadb and that was all for the 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 compliance and governance purpose now the problem is we are missing out things and the attack is happening through that side and many ransomware if you look at it has happened on devices which we it was either orphaned or unmanaged which was lying in our network with a privilege so we may have to go back to basics and relook at saying that whether we can sustain in the current model that's really interesting so on that note with increasing attacks and more advanced attacks what are your thoughts on the need for protecting not just the outer perimeter not just taking vulnerability management and and focusing that on the network and the endpoints and even the operating systems but actually looking at the storage systems really the the, the core data storage systems that hold all of the gold mine of data do you think there's a real need today to scale vulnerability management solutions and strategies to the storage systems the vulnerability management and configuration management okay this is two are tied together has to extend to so many new areas if you look at the recent attacks which we have seen on cameras which is an ot attack which is coming into picture in that level earlier while technological capabilities were there to do assessments on ot nobody was m- not much bothered because we didn't know whether it was a serious thing we need to look at what was the threat level who is the owner a lot of even buts were there but now we have seen as a reality the attacks are coming in that way so when we come back to storage storage is where our core data which is our the the, the basic thing is is all stored the entire business functions on that data but compared to couple of years back now the data is also federated and sitting it it is not only on a single database at our backend it is federated it is it is hosted in cloud and and so that level is there but for your question yes the vulnerability management configuration management strong policy around the governance of all these devices is is need of the hour okay great and what are the possible impacts of an unsecured storage system in your perspective see storage system if you look at the three different levels or four different levels one is that the confidentiality side what if that data which is going to be leaked data can be our uh, business uh, sensitive data it can be pi data it can be of any of that nature availability of the data which is critical for us to have the service availability or service resilience at any point of time integrity of the data we have not seen much of an attack happening on the integrity so what if the uh, data is been manipulated because i was speaking to one airlines industry and there one of the biggest problem was what if the data which has been collected and processed is been manipulated say a location data while an aircraft is on the air uh, so so these are the possibilities this is not an impossible use cases or a scenario we are talking about this are all possible uh, so, and the fourth one is the accountability side if somebody does the changes do we have a track of saying that who is doing the 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 entire uh, the activity over there and again coming back does the organization has the visibility of their data or the information how it is flowing where is it stored so database for sure is 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 a waterfall for us let's talk a bit about roles and responsibilities within an organization do you think there's a gap between the security teams the infosec teams and the infrastructure and and storage teams and if so do you think there needs to be closer alignment between these teams in 2021 and onwards see there is surely gaps between them there also some responsibility um so typically what happens is this take an example i'm coming back to since it is very recent this camera issue camera is is owned by physical security team it is is operated or or uh, maintained by the it team does the ciso has a role there because the mark okay is it part of his is but should he be worried yes he should be worried because if you have a compromise on your ot system which is one of that is camera or a printer you surely have a huge impact on your network 
So th- there is thing. And and traditionally how organizations worked, whichever is a gray area, nobody owns it. It is resource. Uh, uh, so I think the, the now the time warrants us to go back and document roles and responsibilities at more granular level of each of this. Because when I say more granular level, who owns it, which means who has the budget, who maintains it, who patches it, who ensures the configurations, who, so that level it has to be maintained. Uh, let's talk a bit about automation. Uh, automation is obviously not a new trend, uh, but it seems to have taken on a new level of importance and meaning coming out of COVID-19. Uh, the ability to automate scanning, automate detection, uh, prioritizing vulnerabilities, for example, and ultimately just freeing up time, right? We, we're all aware that security teams are overworked. Uh, and if there's something that can help them free up their time and also replace a lot of the uh, monotonous tasks that they're faced with, that, that should be something of interest. Do you think automation will continue to be a strategic uh, role in 2021? It is very, very, very much. The reason is this one. We are walk, we're talking about huge volume of data. And let us take an application security as an example. Now, application security, traditionally, we used to do changes once in a while, and most of these applications were hosted inside our network. Now the situation changed. Majority of the applications are web components, which is hosted directly to the internet or hosted in the cloud. And earlier, we know exactly what type of language we use, how the architecture works, because it was all standardized. Now we are talking about microservices, APIs, containers, all new jargons where security guys are not getting it correctly. Okay, and the containers came into picture. Now we need to shift left. When and earlier, it was a waterfall method where the developers finishes the entire activity, comes to the security team, waits for weeks to get a clearance, and then go ahead and do it. Now, Agile is the new model. The, nobody has that time. And every application goes through multiple changes every month. It can be a feature, it can be a bug, it can be various things. Now, the traditional model cannot work. So you need to shift this back to the developer and say, be part of the assessment. Having said that, you cannot sh- shift the role and say, you do what we were supposed to do. It is not that. We need to automate the end thing where ideally create an abstraction layer. They just click one. All the assessment happens at that level based on the policy you define, and it has to go ahead. One example, the correlation of all the vulnerabilities. You are picking up data from at least around 10 different tools. Earlier, it was only say a Nessus co- uh, tool runs an infrastructure scan. That was enough. Now we are talking about Tanium giving a data, all the SAS, DAS, MAST, uh, uh, binary codes, uh, false code, everything giving data. So we are talking about 10, 15 different tools giving the data, and you need to normalize and prioritize what need to touch. And, and, and humanly, it is not possible to run the old way of manual. Also, we have a huge constraint of resources, and they cannot be equipped with all these technologies. We need to automate everything possible. So that, that should be the way. We have, we have to target and say, automation is the first priority, automate everything, and whatever is left out, look at the human intervention. Early, it was the opposite way. We automate the minimum and then look at this. So we have to shift the entire thing. It's already happening in many organizations. Yeah. Great. Uh, and finally, what are your top tips for CISOs to get a bigger seat at the table, to secure boardroom investment, and ultimately uh, bridge that gap between technology and business? So the biggest need for a CISO to, to sustain effectively in an organization is to get the management support on change management. Normally, we, we looked at uh, the management support for a budget site or resources requirement. But for a CISO, what is required is a change management because you are going to do things which is not the norm or people we are doing for 10 years, you are suddenly going back and say, administrative privilege on your system, we are not going to allow or a USB drive, I am not going to allow or I am not. I am going to block a .exe on your email. So various things based on the threat level you are going to change. You need a management support to make that effective. Otherwise, so many VIPs will come where your entire program will be diluted. Every VIP who need an exemption is, is putting a hole on your, uh, on your uh, program. 
So coming to the, the board level, my view is that CISOs will ne- should not be, be looking at a permanent seat on a board, but CISO should be a critical resource providing input on the technology risk and security and privacy to the board. That input should be used for their strategy. But if you're sitting as a full-time board member, I don't know what you will be doing other time when they were looking at the financial risk or market risk and those type of things. Sunil, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Doran, and uh, really appreciate and thank you for having me in this.